welcome all to our uh, second remote licensing committee meeting. Um, it's just past six o'clock and we're live on, on YouTube. Um, welcome, I'll start going through the agenda. Have we got any apologies for absence? Uh, no apologies for, for absence, uh, Chair. Um, and we have an addition, yeah, with no apologies for absence. Steve. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, members' interests. Uh, if any members have any items now or as they come up, just indicate. No. And declare them. Um, is no. recommend. Sorry. <laughs> just All, right. Right. All right. Anyway, hey, Steve. All right. Um, admission of the public. It's not recommended that the public be excluded from the meeting for the consideration of item to the business on this agenda. There are a few representatives of the trade who may be attending who, are, who we may invite to speak on certain items. Um, but other than that, this is uh, being broadcast live. So uh, any member of the public can log in and see. Um, <coughs> so minutes of the licensing and regulatory committee held on the 8th of June. Uh, do members consider that a, an accurate record? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, move that chair. Thank you. Happy to second. Okay. All those in favour, please show. Okay. And that's carried. Are you are you in favour, Chris? Just to check. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Check. All right, there we go. That's that's full coverage. Okay. Uh I'll go over to our next item and the substantive item on our agenda tonight. Um and I'll uh, hand over to Fiona Goldsmith, who has prepared a report for us uh, on this topic. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, members of the Licensing and Regulatory Committee are tonight asked to consider a mandatory requirement for all hackney carriage and private hire drivers to wear a face covering when transporting customers. There is currently no legal or mandatory requirement for hackney carriage and private hire drivers to wear a face covering, and the vehicle, but the vehicle operators find themselves in close proximity to the occupants of their vehicles with little or no protection for themselves or the passengers they're transporting. We are currently working with our partners to develop a set of interventions to support the licensees to reduce the risk to both themselves and the <coughs> carrying. Um, to, we have received an email in support of the move for the public and driver safety, in particular face masks, uh, which was sent to the licensing authority prior to the meeting, which was from the Halifax Taxi Association. <clears throat> and it's recommended that members consider the addition of a temporary condition to all private hire driver licenses and to the Hackney Carriage Code of Conduct, which requires that all vehicle operators wear, do wear a face covering when transporting passengers for as long as the relevant health authorities deem there's a risk from COVID-19, with the exception of those drivers who hold a medical exemption. And the addition of a temporary condition to all private hire operator licenses to ensure that all drivers who take passengers on behalf of the company wear a face covering when transporting those passengers for as long as relevant health authorities deem there is a risk from COVID-19, with the exception of those drivers who hold a valid medical exemption. At the time of writing the report, members were also asked to consider a recommendation that the local authority encourages drivers and operators to ask customers to wear a face covering during their journey and that the council will fully support any driver who refuses to take a passenger for not wearing a face covering unless that passenger has a genuine medical exemption for not wearing one. In section 4.5 of the report it states that there should should the risk to the public health increase any measures agreed will be reviewed which could potentially see further recommendations to the licensing committee to consider additional requirements. Since we wrote the report, Calderdale has seen an increase of infection rates and therefore members may wish to consider to resolve to amend or add an additional requirement. It's a matter for you, Chair. <coughs> Councillor Sutherland, you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't cut you uh, while you were giving your report. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you for such an in-depth report. And I know you, Derek, and all the team have been doing an awful lot of work to help the trade through this time. 
uh, and to get us to a place where you, you've got a report with a series of recommendations. Appreciating that there's, to be fair, some gaps in the in maybe the national legislation and guidance, and you're doing your best here to try and find a creative solution mm -hmm. that uh, sort of uh, creates a good balance, protecting drivers and and uh, encouraging members of the public to do what they're required to do. Um, I'll I'll go to some members and then I might ask uh, uh, Derek Ben to see if he's got any any comments and then I'll go out to uh, uh, any other members of the trade. I don't know if Stephen Gale wants to speak as well. Uh, I didn't see the order people put their hands up, but I definitely saw Councillor Carter's hand. So, Councillor Carter, do you want to go first? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a question. Um, have we contacted government? Do you know um, about? what their view is because normally hackney carriages and private hire vehicles are considered as an alternative form of transport and they come under transport rules and regulations normally um now uh, trains and buses have it there in black and white what the expectation is from both the operators and the and the passengers so i just wondered if we if we'd had a chance to get any guidance from government as to why hackney carriages and private hire vehicles didn't appear to be within that transport bit. Thank you. Does anybody want to take that one? I'll take that one if that's all right. No, we, we haven't contacted central government, but when they when they when they introduced the new regulations under the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing a Face Coverings on Public Transport Regulations 2020. Um, they did put private hire and taxis as exempt from those. The thoughts behind that, I'm not sure. Thanks, Chair. It's it's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> no. Well, I think I think it'd be worth us having a discussion through through some means. And whatever decision we make tonight, it might be worth communicating what we're doing and perhaps if there is a channel, find some sort of dialogue so we understand. And especially if you're saying that you may well come back to committee with uh, further recommendations in future if the situation changes, it may be, be good to have that dialogue. And I presume at some level in the council, there's fairly regular meetings with central government on coronavirus related matters. So there may be a way to feed uh, our decision or potential decision into that and ask what thoughts are and what any any further developments may be. Um, Councillor Pillai. Thank you, Chair. Just following on from where Councillor Carter has left off, uh, I would have said it would have been normal to follow the public transports like the buses to for the passengers to wear masks like the drivers do there. So I think it's, it's a matter of course really that we're just ironing this out now and um, getting it to uh, be effective. Thank you. Councillor Holden. Thanks, Chair. I'm fully supportive of what's being what's being put forward. Um, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we protect the, the licensed trade. We've, we're currently in a position where half of Calderdale has, has still been <coughs> under, under increased restrictions. Um, I think we'd be foolish not to not to adopt these measures in the interim. Okay. Thank you. I'll um I'll come to you now, Councillor Clark, and then I'll come to you next, Derek, if you uh, if you want to add your comments and thoughts. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering about can we actually make it legal, or can we make it advisory? Can we only make it advisory, a, a strict mm -hmm. advice, rather than making it legal within Calderdale? We can't make our own laws as such, can we? That's what concerns me, you know, the... I don't know if Fiona, the Chris, or if uh, Derek wants to pick that one. Pick I, that I, one. I, I it's something that's been discussed. Yeah, yeah. I can take this one. Um, Chair, it, it is possible to do it by, for example, bylaws or public space protection, order, but that may not be the best tool to use. Um, the processes for bylaws under the 2016 regulations and uh, um, in PSPOs are similar and they need extensive assessment 
and uh, consultation. In particular, in the set of bylaws, uh, there has to be an assessment of whether the burden can be achieved by alternative means. Now, when we're dealing with um, um, bringing in be the rule or a law to, which makes taxi drivers wear face coverings, it applies to a specific group as opposed mm. to being a requirement of the public in general. So an alternative means chair available is, as has been mentioned, a temporary condition on the policy. This has the effect of a rule which applies to the specific group, taxi drivers who we are requiring or want to require to wear face coverings. And it also dovetails with the aim of the policy to ensure that the public safety isn't compromised. Thank you, Chris. Uh, at this point, then I'll bring I'll bring Derek in um, to, to add your views. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if I could start by maybe voicing a, a view in terms of uh, Carter's uh, comment around consulting with uh, the legislators on this. Uh, we we do that on a regular basis in terms of particularly around amendments to the regulations. Uh, I think we were all surprised as officers that uh, uh, carriages and private license, uh, uh, private hire vehicles were exempt in the regulations. I think for me, and it's a personal opinion, uh, but I'm more than happy to go back and speak to the joint biosecurity people that we uh, engage with on a regular basis. I think for me, I think when this uh, change came out and the regulations under the public health, I think what it was is I think there was more concern about numbers. I think there was more of a uh, focus on large numbers of people being transported. And in some ways, I'm feeling that that's probably the reason that led to taxi uh, private hire and acne being excluded from the legislation. I think clearly, as we've seen now with the uh, dynamic situation around pandemic, there's now been more of a uh, focus on small groups meeting together, people meeting in their own dwellings, etc. So I think in some ways, without trying to get into the mind of the legislators, I think the dynamics around our understanding of the pandemic have probably changed, but I will go back and see clarity if that's what the committee want. Uh, in terms of the report, uh, which obviously identifies uh, the uh, recommendations, I think Fiona was right in pointing out the dynamic nature of the virus and how things are changing on a regular basis. And we've seen the introduction this week of further legislation. We also know that the situation in Calderdale, we are not seeing a typical recovery that you have from any incidents. We are seeing very much that W whereby we have peaks and troughs. And at the moment, we do know that within Calderdale and other parts across the country, so we're not alone in this, there has been a further increase in transmission and infection rates. With that in mind, Chair, I'm, I'm asking to, from the committee to consider a further uh, recommendation in relation to a, almost, I shall I call it, a statement of intent and what we're asking for is possibly uh, uh, with your approval is for, the, is for an additionality which would see us putting out a statement endorsing the fact that we have added conditions to the policy for taxi drivers to wear face covering to protect their passengers. So clearly we're asking drivers to make arrangements to have face coverings to protect their passengers. We're now looking to seek an amendment that actually asks for that same responsibility from the traveling public. So what we're looking for is also, the council also expects passengers to wear face coverings in taxis 
to protect the taxi drivers. So it's a reciprocal arrangement. Not only are our taxi drivers and operators protecting the traveling public, but the traveling public are also protecting our drivers and operators. And we're asking for this in relation to the fact that we want to protect the taxi drivers who due to the nature of their role are at an item risk of contracting coronavirus. The council has the duty to protect taxi drivers who serve the community in providing an important role. So in some ways, a statement of intent from this committee that asks for compliance, there is no, we have no ability to enforce this, but asking for compliance from the traveling public to wear face coverings should, unless there is a medical exception. So basically what we're asking for is our drivers and operators to respect the health of the traveling public and likewise the traveling public to respect the health of the driver and operators. And we would look to do that through education. We would look to do that through awareness with the uh, introduction of stickers in vehicles and also at taxi ranks to remind the traveling public and the taxi drivers and operators the need to wear face coverings at this time, given that we're un in unprecedented circumstances and we are seeing an increase again in the transmission and the infection rate within Calderdale. Thank you, Derek. I'll bring in Councillor Carr and then Councillor, Councillor Lambert, and then I'll try and bring us in for a decision and a discussion about that point. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, uh, Christopher and, and Derek. Um, brings me back to the problem that I've got. And the problem that I've got is that there is no legislation there and there's nothing enforceable. So there's nothing enforceable under, under COVID-19 regulations. Pleased to be able to assist our hackney carriage drivers uh, should there be an issue, um, which leaves them in a very vulnerable position. Because if they are saying that the council has said that people should wear masks and they get somebody that's really disruptive, then how can they get around that? Because if, if police is sent for, the police can't support them. They are left completely on their own then. I think there needs to be some mechanism of doing this. We think we need primarily to sort out the issue of and say, is mm -hmm. something that, that we should look at when there's local lockdowns and things? And was it an oversight? Yes, we appreciate that we're looking at large numbers, but it can be a big issue when the when the small numbers very close together. But I think the 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 recommendation should be that we are we are trying to, as Derek Derek sort of put it in words in what his last few few things that he said. It can only be that we're supporting it in an advisory capacity, and we cannot have it as you cannot put it as a requirement because there's no there's nothing. You can't enforce it because there is no legislation behind that to enforce it. And I certainly wouldn't want to go down a bylaw route, as Christopher has already indicated, because that to me would not be uh, solve the problem. I fully understand where we're at. Um, I have heard things said that because the driver is in front and the passengers are behind, then there is less likelihood of a driver transmitting to a passenger and a, trans and a passenger transmitting to a driver. When you're looking at a, a London Hackney carriage type vehicle that has a screen between them, obviously, of course, there is, a there is a big safety element there. But in a normal Hackney carriage or a normal private hire vehicle without that screen, then there is no protection. I am struggling, Chair, to be honest with you, to, to do either A, B, C or D. Um, but I am more inclined to go down a route that it's education and and looking at everybody's best nature, if they possibly can, and putting something in a vehicle that says, can you please put a mask on for your protection and that of the driver? Now, I'm happy to go down that type of a route, but I'm struggling with A, B, C and D, I have to be honest. OK, thank you. Councillor Lambert. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, do, I do agree with exactly um, everything that Geraldine has said. I mean, we do have a duty of care uh, to support our drivers, 
but I wouldn't like to see um, policing of people who aren't wearing masks and the added aggravation on a Friday or a Saturday night um, with members of the public who are blatantly refusing or saying that, you know, they've got an exemption because the exemptions, to be honest, I mean, we've seen lots of cases where people have been, um, well, there's a case uh, where a gentleman was arrested at the White Rose um, who didn't have an exemption badge, but he said, I don't have to have one. Um, I am exempt because I have a breathing condition. It's very woolly around this and I just don't want to, I wouldn't want to see um, a lot of aggravation for our drivers. So I think an advisory suggestion to passengers to please wear one if you possibly can. I think that is definitely a route we need to be going down rather than a mandatory. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gallagher, I think I've got you, have I got your hand up? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know how to do the rest. Firstly, um, Chair, I'd like to apologise for being late, um, and all the members as well, I apologise for that, I, I was just having problems. Um, I, I'm not going to repeat everything that Geraldine has said, but again, I agree with Geraldine in terms of enforcement and, and, and the guidelines. And listen, you don't have to be out on a Friday or a Saturday night or a Sunday or whenever, you know, to uh, start worrying about the um, altercations that can happen. You only have to go into a Tesco. As I work in retail, I'm on the front door and I know exactly how people are behaving in terms of being asked to be mindful about a face covering. Now, personally for me, um, I live in Ellen, so you don't have to, you know, use a big stick to find out what taxi rank I am using, but They've all been very good and they're the ones that are, are, are leading the way in wearing the masks as well. But uh, they are employees and there is no enforcement and there's no guidelines in terms of that. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, it should be uh, the responsibility of the passenger. But again, like I say, I'd like to reiterate, you don't have to be out on a Friday and Saturday. Just pop up to your local supermarket, get a pint of milk and you can see it all kicking off there anyway. Okay, without support and without the support of the police. So that's what I want to say. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Holden, and you may also have seen, I think Derek shared his suggested wording as well, which I think is quite useful. Councillor Holden. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I mean, we are only asking it to be advisory, aren't we, at the end, at the end of the day, we can't, because we can't do anything else. Um, just to pick up on something that Councillor Carter mentioned regarding uh, taxis with screens, there has been some research gone into, um, into the transmission, and, and actually even taxis with screens aren't a foolproof way of protecting the travelling public because of the ventilation systems, you know, so... I mean, what we're, what we're asking for is, this is exactly the same as what we're asking them to do when they go out into a shop, when they go out in public, where they're in, in close proximity to others, is use common sense. And if at all possible, if they haven't got an exemption, just wear a mask. You know, it's, it's not, I, I don't think it's too onerous. Obviously, we can't enforce it. So it's, it's just publicising it and getting that word out there and, and showing that we do actually care about, about our, our licensed trade. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your comments. Taking on board the points around enforcement, I think the shared message is that we want to uh, convey a view to the public uh, in many ways to take some of the burden off the drivers because to expect the drivers to effectively manage this on their, on their own without clear support from the council in doing this um, is going to provide them some very difficult and challenging circumstances late on any night, potentially. Um, so whilst we're changing these conditions, I think it makes sense to include the additional condition that Derek is suggesting, uh, which sends out a clear message and hopefully perhaps some of the local media might pick that up or we might be able to prod them to help them in the, uh, to help in the promotion of that message. Um, so the public are hearing it directly from us, not just when they first jump in a taxi. Okay, does anybody have any further? Councillor Carter? Oh, I should tell you you're on mute. Uh, the conclusion of the... I hate this. I'm getting too old for this pantomime. Um, the report is saying on the conclusion we should... Um, 
do various things under A, B, C and D. And these are what I'm struggling with. Maintain the existing conditions and not add a condition to require vehicle operators to wear face covering, which I think has to be my stance. But then I need, I need to put the other bit in that Derek is suggesting and not B, C and D, um, which, is where sat, which is where I'm sat really at the minute. Does that? I don't. I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. I uh, before I take everyone else in, that is a good point, Janet. I had just remembered about Stephen. Stephen, are you wishing to make a comment before I take any any further well, comments from members as we're getting close to a decision on this? It seems. The the, the only comment I can make is um, it's it's some, I do agree with what. Uh, Derek Ben said that it is a possibility to go down the route that he suggested. The only thing that mystifies me is how this how the terminology has come through that taxis are not public transport. When I always believed that they were. Now that that is a strange one, is that how anybody could define a taxi as not being public transport and come under the same umbrella? It just beggars belief. So, you know, that is one point. The other point is I don't know the legal stance. Perhaps Christopher Riley could perhaps shed some light on it. And it's this, that the proprietor of a business, if he asks somebody that's wanting to come onto that premises that's undesirable, surely they should have the right to be able to object to them entering without that face covering. And uh, you know, to say that, you know, the, the taxi driver has to accept somebody coming in to a vehicle and um, infect them without any mm. any any possibility of him re rejecting that person from getting in the vehicle seems completely unfair and unreasonable. And that's basically, I think, from our side, you know, we would support any any of the members that can push something forward. In, in, in getting this objective of people getting in and out of the vehicles with face coverings on for the protection of everybody concerned. Uh, that's basically our comment, um, if you know, if you could consider, if you consider that without leaving it up to the mind of the public because unfortunately it doesn't work. Does it? You know, some of them it does, but a lot of them it doesn't. Well, Two uh, brief points, Chair, in respect to that. There is always the um, very basic uh, common law power. If, if somebody is trespassing on your property in your house, for example, then you can use reasonable force to evict that person. So similarly, if a person board the taxi, be it um, a, a decline, it, to wear a mask or even outside of the COVID, if a, a drunken or abusive person was a problem to the taxi driver's safety, then he can use reasonable force to remove that person. And although there is a requirement, it's an offence for a, for a happy carriage driver to refuse a fare. It wouldn't apply if you had a person who was putting or potentially putting the driver at risk. And certainly if a driver perceived a risk from, for example, a person not wearing a mask, then a prosecution wouldn't ensue. In respect of enforcing, we are, I think I have to say that we have a glass ceiling in the national um, coronavirus regulations exempt taxis from the way that buses and train passengers uh, have the, the, the requirements. So we are bound or in fact limited by that. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to invite Derek in. I would say that I think we need to be conscious and tread carefully about discriminating against people with disabilities as well. Um, it is a real minefield. 
and the idea of just rejecting anybody who isn't wearing a mask is is very challenging you could be fitting in your 20s and you might have cystic fibrosis or some other uh, chronic condition and um, that's why I think we're putting potentially drivers in a really challenging situation if we don't have a, a clear stance one way or another um, and that will work with them in a supportive fashion and I think that's the only way we, we do it because uh, we can't expect drivers to individually be become medical assessors and assess whether someone is disabled or, or, or necessarily exempt but I think it's sensible that we have a really clear space to challenge and question and put signs and, and show the drivers that they have the support of the council in what they're in what they're doing. Derek I'll just bring you in and then I'll come to you uh, Councillor Holden. Uh, Chair I'm more than happy to let Councillor Holden go first I was just trying to bring a bit of clarity to what we actually would like the committee to decide today so uh, if you wouldn't mind me just allowing to sum, sum up in straightforward terms about what we're asking for and what we're saying is advisory. So if it's okay with you, uh, I'm more than happy to let Councillor Olden go first and then I'll come in at the end to try and provide a bit of uh, clarity, please, Chair. That sounds good, thank you. I was actually gonna go with a proposal, Chair, that we, um, I propose that we go for option E, incorporating the wording that Derek's provided to, uh, to everyone. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go back to Derek at this point because we've probably got two. Yeah. We've got e, pl e plus Derek's comment and A plus Derek's comment. So either way, Derek, your comment's popular. I think for me, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Chair. I think for me, this has been quite a difficult report for officers to write because we're dealing with really quite strange times. So just trying to bring a bit of clarity. Uh, I think for me, what we're asking for is is for the policy and, and for two additional requirements. The first requirement for me is around all vehicle operators to wear a face covering when transporting passengers for as long as the relevant health authorities deem that there's a risk from COVID-19. So this is a temporary requirement with the exception of those who drivers who hold a valid medical exemption card. We are not going to be asking drivers to evidence whether or not they are exempt. We will pick that up as and when circumstances arise, and then we'll have a conversation with the vehicle operator. Two, we're then asking a requirement for all private hire operators to ensure that all drivers who take passages on behalf of the company wear a face covering when transporting those passengers. Again, for as long as there is the risk to COVID-19, with the exception, obviously, of those who have a medical uh, uh, condition. And then the last one, and this is the one where the local authority encourages drivers and operators. So this is, we're just asking for compliance. We have no grounds to enforce this. We would not wish to enforce this. We do not want to put our drivers or operators at risk. But we would just encourage drivers and operators to ask customers to wear a face covering during their journey and that the council will fully support any driver who refuses to take a passenger should they not wear a face covering unless that passenger has a genuine reason. So again, just gives an option for a operator or a driver to refuse a fare but should they feel it is inappropriate to ask, should they feel it presents a risk, then there will be no inference drawn from that. And then obviously the additional advisory uh, comment with regards to asking the travelling public to wear face masks. So I don't know if I've overcomplicated it, Councillor Sutherland, and I do apologise if I have, but we're asking for two added requirements. Then the encouragement from operators and drivers for the traveling public to wear masks and then obviously our plea to the traveling public to respect the health of the private uh, and acne uh, driver uh, drivers within the trade. Thank you Derek. Councillor Carter. Um, did you not listen to anything that was said Derek? I because you've have... just totally, you've totally disregarded everything that we've said, that some of us have said. 
No, how, how, can, how, how can we make it a requirement when it's unenforceable and not legislative? I'm, I'm, I'm re how can we make that a requirement of our hackney carriage drivers and our and our private hire vehicle operators? We cannot force them to do something that has no legislative backing. Everything else that we do as a requirement for them having a license has some legislative backing somewhere along the line, whether it be vehicular ones or whatever to do with safety of passengers. This has no, none whatsoever, legislative backing. There is nothing in the COVID-19 legislation that says that private hire vehicles and taxi operate, taxi drivers, acne carriage drivers have to wear a face mask. We cannot make it a legal requirement of their license. It is um, just absolutely outrageous to even be go down that route. We cannot make it an, a legal requirement. And the other element for me is that you're still putting an onus on that, on that driver to make a decision about a passenger. They cannot make that decision. Chair, I, I honestly think we should have had, I honestly believe that we should have had, tried to get some, some better guidance from government with regards to this on, on a pickup. And if government are absolutely categoric that hackney carriage vehicles and, and private hire vehicles are not part of the transport mechanisms, then are not covered by COVID-19 transport regulations, then I cannot start sticking mandatory requirements into a licence and saying you can't have a license because you are refusing to do this. And where are you going to get the evidence from? That well, What are you going to say to the drivers? Oh, you've got to go to a doctor and buy, and buy a piece of paper that says that you've got a, re, a, a medical thing that says you can't, you can't wear a mask. I'm sorry, but I just cannot see where that is going. I mean, I thought I'd made myself very clear that I, I feel the only avenue that as a council we can go down is supporting the, the operators and, and actually putting notices into the travelling public that says, you will do this, unless I'm wrong. I know, Christopher, I, I, I broke up partway through what he was saying, but unless I've picked up wrong, a hackney carriage or a private hire vehicle operator can refuse to take a fare. Yeah. Sure. And the, uh, under the current rules and regulations, they can refuse to take a chair, a, a fare. Now, that is enforceable by and supportable by our enforcement officers, and I would imagine through with the police as well, for whatever reason. Trying to get an acne carriage operator to say, or a private hire operator to say, to enforce something that has that he gets no support from a police officer and no support from one of our enforcement officers because you can't, you can't demand it because there's no legislation there to support it. I just think he's going down a route that we cannot do. I understand where you're coming from with COVID-19. I haven't been in Tesco with Angie since lockdown because I'm not allowed out and I'm not allowed into Tesco's. But before even this happened, the, the, the rubbish that she puts up with on that desk is unbelievable. And, and you can't be, imagine what she's putting up with now, because I know from my own experience of what's been told to me, there's a lot of people out there refusing to wear masks, full stop, categorically, will not do as they told. I think we're asking far too much with what you're wanting to put it as a requirement. I don't know where this requirement is coming from when you've no when you've nothing to back it up. If there was something, to, tell me if there's something to back it up. And I'll let's let's let 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 let's let them respond. I know I think Chris and both Derek want to respond. I'm going to let you go, Chris, first, and then we'll and then we'll let you follow. Yeah, um, I think I'm, I think there may be some confusion between Councillor Carter and Derek. The option. A requirement to have taxi drivers wear a mask isn't isn't um, a law. It will be, if it's chosen, a temporary condition on the taxi license. So, if it were imposed as a condition, if it's breached, 
by the driver. It isn't an offence. It's a breach of the condition which could be dealt with by way of a sanction and ultimately could be pleaded as the driver not being fit and proper. But it, it wouldn't be a, a crime as per an offence under statute or regulation or a bylaw. So it, it would be condition of a license as opposed to an offence. Okay. Councillor, come, come, back, come back briefly, but I want, to, I want to let other members in and I presume you want to be, still be here when we make the decision. Do you need to unmute? Geraldine, you're on mute. Sorry. We're actually penalising the drivers here, not supporting them. If we're going to if we make it a condition of their licence, then if they breach it, then we're going to put them some sanction on it. And when you get so many sanctions, then you lose your flipping licence. So we're going to have a situation. Oh, we're not. Oh, we're supporting you really, but we're going to sanction you if you don't if you don't wear your mask. I mean, what what sort of a pantomime is that? You can't. I want to support these drivers. I really do want to support them, but I don't think making it a requirement of the license and making it mandatory is supporting them. I think that's absolutely doing the opposite. In my opinion, I'm sorry, but I just... I... Okay, thank you. Do I have any other members indicating to give a view? We've probably got one of two proposals that we're going to go down here. Councillor Sweeney. Thank you. Um, I think we just need to keep this as it is very clear we have the authority and the power to insist drivers wear face masks. We don't have any powers to insist the public. But asking the drivers to wear face masks protects the public. And I think that's what, you know, it's like we've gone on to protecting the drivers, which is fine. But we also have to protect the public. So I think that both the proposals are, are fine. And it, the legality in terms of crimes and everything else is a, is a red herring that is meaningless. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Fiona? Uh, Hi. Sorry, yes. I was just going to speak on behalf of Derek, but he's back now. All right. And then I've got you uh, I do apologise, Chair. For some reason or another, uh, I've heard everything, but uh, I just lost uh, the ability to respond so councillor carter i fully accept i listen to everything you said i do think this is really quite complex i think we're in really unprecedented times we believe we've got the legal framework as supported by chris to add these requirements to the uh policy what we're asking for is a temporary adjustment and requirements during the covid19 response we're in really unprecedented times we've had to be incredibly creative and innovative around the regulations that have been passed to us. We've taken action and Fiona will be giving an update on what we've done during these really unprecedented times very shortly. But believe me, we have asked uh, our legal colleagues to look at this to see if there is uh, any uh, reason why we can't proceed. So I fully accept your argument. I have no issues with what your comments are. Uh, I just think for me, it doesn't change our recommendation, which we feel is being done in the interest of protecting public health. Thank you, Derek. I've got Councillor Pillai. Um, we'll, 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 get, we'll get to our decision probably once everyone's given a view on everyone stopped wanting to share one. So Chris, go ahead. Chair, yeah, thank you. Very briefly, A, I'm seconding um, Councillor Holden's proposal to begin with. And B, I totally hear what Derek Ben has said this far. And C, finally, I think it's, if the um, legalities and the framework is there to use, then let's take the advice from Derek Ben and move along with that and for some form of words to be put together. And certainly I was going to indicate that this purely can be a voluntary, but I think we need to safeguard both the drivers and the traveling public at the same time. And I think it's a matter of getting a fine balance to it. Okay. 
Thank you. I, uh, I would say I do fully appreciate Councillor Carter's concerns with us requiring to make people effectively have to wear these pretty much all day, which I mean I'd be I'd be concerned about, and I and I think we should keep this this under review and and see and see the and listen to the feedback that we get from from drivers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've had that proposal seconded. Councillor Card Cart has put forward a proposal which is to maintain the existing regulation and put out the additional statement from Derek Ben. Um, do we have a do we have a, a seconder for that proposal? Okay. In the absence of that, I'm going to put forward Councillor Holden's, Holden's proposal, which is uh, rec uh, recommendation E with the additional statement that uh, Derek Ben has uh, written in the chat, chat function and he shared verbally um, when, he, when he spoke. Um, so if anybody's not aware of what that uh, additional statement is, uh, let me know now. No. Councillor Gallagher? Yeah, I'm having problems with um, hearing everybody. Uh, so I didn't actually get the whole of what uh, the recommendation was. Could anybody repeat it for me, please? So the recommendation was recommendation E, which includes uh, B, which is around vehicle operators wearing a face covering, C, which is around the operators making sure their drivers are wearing face coverings where appropriate, and D, uh, is is a is a is a, recommenda is a recommendation and some support for drivers around speaking to customers where appropriate. Now, on on the point of um, drivers exemptions, this is something we, we we did have a discussion about before the meeting, and I don't think there was an idea that we would be proactively checking or making people provide evidence in any way. Um, but it would be if 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 as and when any issues came up around drivers, and and we expect. Both the drivers and the and the travel traveling public to exercise their own their own judgment and appropriate behaviour when they're in these situations, and that's the only way you can govern anything. You can't enforce uh, something when there isn't general public compliance. Okay, are there any further comments? Is it clear what is it clear what the is it clear what the recommendation is now? And then in the chat function is the um, the extra bit, Angie, if you've not seen that. No, I haven't seen that. Um, this is up for review again, isn't it? So the the recommendations talk about uh, the relevant whilst the relevant health authorities deem there is a risk, which is slightly ambiguous. But I, propose, I, pre, um, I presume that that's on purpose, purposefully ambiguous, so it can be flexible. Uh, but I presume it would be for the committee to review at any point, anyway, because it could remove the conditions. If it if it if it's off it, I presume. Councillor Carter? What would determine the risk? Because the current position we call today is that half the borough is on lockdown, the other half is on a lot less lockdown, but there's still the, the no meetings above six. So at what point would the authority consider that the risk has gone, therefore this can be lifted? We we are giving the drivers one heck of a responsibility here. And I think they need to have some idea of, of what they are up against with regards to what the risk is. I mean, let's be fair, unless there's a vaccine found in the near, very near future, we'll be at risk of this for at least another 12 months until it mutates into something else and then it'll be something different that takes us. So, you know, it, it's at what point is that risk not there? At what point in a, in a serious scenario from government does that risk disappear? When, when COVID disappears or when our numbers get down to a certain level, that's not going to affect, that's not going to help the drivers because they can be picking somebody up at the station who's come from anywhere in the world. So that is not going to be easy for them to manage either. So what what are we going to it's all right saying we're going to determine it later but i think there needs to be a bit of an idea of what that determination is and, and how we're going to review it what 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 are we going to review it against how are we setting it against because the borough is split into ours as it stands okay. 
I'll allow Fiona to answer in the first instance and then I'll, uh, yeah. I'll come to you. Thanks, Councillor. Chair. Um, well, I think what we would be doing is we would be, we'd be led by our public health service. So what, what we would not go with what public health advice and possibly when we, we come off the watch list, because obviously we're on the watch list at the moment. So at, at that point, it could be reviewed. Isn't that problem? Asked. Half the borough are not on the watch list. You can't use the watch list as the bottom as the bottom line because half the borough are not on the watch list. The Calder Valley constituency is not on the watch list. So Okay. I don't I don't want us to get into too much of an argument about this. At the end of the day, if people go on a bus, this is a requirement. And I suppose mm -hmm. what some people are trying to say is that there should be a consideration of similarity across the trade. Um, what the future will bring. I mean, three months ago, six months ago, there was when when this was when when the lockdown was at its strictest, there was no recommendations around wearing masks, and barely anybody did. And who knows where the situation will be in six months' time? Um, Councillor Holden, yeah, can I suggest that we review it in six months' time, which gives us a, a firm date then, as far as as far as any review goes, and then it it, it just gives a bit of clarity, I think. I'm happy with that as a suggestion. I think it'd be worth having having a look at how it's been going in six months' time anyway. Um, are people generally happy with that being incorporated? I think Chris, you, sec you seconded his uh, proposal. Steve? Yes, yes, I did. <clears throat> Steve, are you wanting to comment? Yeah, it was just, uh, you need to make it six months maximum. If everything sorts out in three months, we want officers to review it prior to that. But yeah. if, it, if it hasn't been reviewed and report sent back to us before then, then six months maximum we'll look at it again. All right. I think yeah, to assist, Chair, briefly, um, from the legality point of view, if, for example, um, it was to be reviewed in six months and if COVID, if a vaccine was found in a week's time and COVID vanished, then obviously the need for wearing the face covers diminished, then each reach would, would be reviewed on that basis. So um, enforcement would do a review on a case to case basis with no overall review in six months' time. Okay, let's round this one off. We've got Councillor Holder's recommendation, which is recommendation E, with the added uh, condition, statement, wording that Derek's provided, or at least our statement of intent, um, and uh, to amend those, those conditions to have a, a, a maximum of six months before they come back for review. Okay. All right. Will all those in favour of that recommendation please show? Okay. And any against? Okay, that's carried. Okay. Thank you, everybody difficult agenda item i know but we will keep that one uh, under close watch and i think it's good that we're going to be having it back in six months um and there's another a number of other items in relation to the trade that we're going to want to be looking at within the next six months as well uh, as you as we as we've got some some indications further down on the report <clears throat> but before we get there we've got the dangerous wild animals licensing policy so Diana, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. I'll keep it quite brief. Um, so as part of its overall licensing framework, Calderdale Council wishes to establish a policy for the licensing of dangerous wild animals. Um, the policy sets out the, will set out the council's approach, which is a benefit to applicants and members of the public and other public authorities. And it will ensure that we have consistency and transparency in our decision making processes. Um, so basically, members are just asked to resolve that over the next 12 months, we can carry out formal consultation on the proposed policy. 
um, we haven't specified the time, the dates for the consultation at the moment due to the current issues with the COVID uh, pandemic, um, but we will want to, um, to commence the consultation as soon as practicable. It's over for you too, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Fiona. Nice to have a report to break up, discussing virus related matters <laughs> all the time. Um, does anybody have any comments at this at this stage? It's not something we've really looked at very much on the license committee, at least not in my experience. Uh, but we've got a policy in front of us and it's going out for consultation and no doubt members of the public or the uh, the one long-standing license, uh, licensed uh, licensee might well have some strong opinions which might might guide us at a future committee day on that policy. Uh, Councillor Sweeney. Thank you. Um, not wishing to sound like Councillor Young, but can I move officers recommendations? Okay. Do we have a seconder for that? Yep, second that. All right. Okay. Uh, all those in favour, please show. Okay. Everybody was, wasn't it? Thank you. It's carried. Definitely got some interesting appendices. Does that report all of the flip through? Yes. What numbers you can can't have in your household? Um, right. Final item was a uh, uh, an update from the uh, licensing team, just to pick up on any other matters. Um, as you've probably seen going through uh, going through to the members' email, um, there's been a few updates from. Uh, licensing over the past six months, uh, which I think we all thought was better than trying to pull everyone together for more meetings, just for the sake of meetings. But whilst we are here, um, that's the only to, to pull together anything else that was that was relevant. Do you want to add anything to uh, to your report there, Fiona? Um, thanks, Jack. No, so we just wanted to do a bit of a, a, an overview of where we're going and what what we've been doing during the pandemic. Um, as we know, Hackney Carriage and Private Hire Licensing has been quite significantly impacted, um, especially, especially with their actual um, communication with ourselves, for example. They've been used to accessing the licensing service in a drop-in basis. But going forward, the way that we're working now, is it, we can't have queues and queues of people here. So we're, we're looking at ways to be able to reopen in a new, fresh way uh, where things are done by appointment only, online appointments only, all applications done online. Um, we're also working really closely with public health to get out the advice and guidance to the taxi trade. Um, I appreciate it's take, it takes time, but we are getting there and hopefully we want to be there to, to actually offer them support, not just, you know, it sometimes feels like we, we're just there um, you know, making rules and regulations for them, but actually we do want to be there to support them. We want to help them through the time. So that's something that we're on with doing at the moment. Under the Licensing Act, we've had a, a new introduction of the Business and Planning Act, which has, re has shown a relaxation of the Licensing Act, which now means that until 30th of September, 2021, um, all licensed premises are uh, permitted to allow the provision of off sales. So like you're, you're off license, that people can go in take their alcohol away and take it home with them a bottle of wine so any licensed premises that didn't have that is now allowed that until the end of September next year um, we're also working pretty much 24 hours a day seven days a week to ensure that we are um, compliance with the COVID regulations and every weekend we've got offices from all areas within the team visiting licensed premises conducting checks to ensure compliance and we're offering advice and guidance to licensees on how best to keep themselves and their staff and their customers safe at this time. So today we've, we've visited 90 licensed premises um, and to check for compliance, um, most of which have had follow-up visits in which officers have engaged and educated those licensees. Um, during the lockdown period, 16 premises were actually closed. Um, since the reopening of the nighttime economy, we've, we've issued 29 stage one letters and 12 stage two letters. So basically a first warning with recommendations about how they can improve. Second warning, slightly harsher, is the stage two letter. And um, we've also gone down the route of issuing four directions in relation to license premises, which has required them to be closed due to non-compliance. 
We've also issued three prohibition notices, which is basically to stop any events from occurring. Within general licensing, there's only been a slight amendment to that, and that's been within the introduction of the Business and Planning Act, Act again, and that's been introduced a cheaper and quicker pavement licence process. That again will run till the 30th of September 21. And the purpose is to allow for businesses to cater for their customers to eat and drink al fresco in order for them to comply with the requirements under the new COVID regulations. Um, I think we've had a bit of a slow uptake on that, but we've got a number of applications in at the moment that are going through the process. So that in a nutshell is, is our, our little update for you with regard to licensing. Does anybody have any questions? I don't think I see any hands. Um, Councillor Holden's hand, I do see. I'd just like to add um, that I think the licensing team have done a done a great job in in pretty exceptional circumstances, and I think as a as a as a licensing uh, committee, we should we should pay thanks to um, to the officers that are going out there. You know, I know it cannot be an easy job, um, especially at the weekend when um, you know alcohol's been had it. Uh, but I think you've, I think the team's done a great job, and I'd like you to pass thanks on. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree. I think the licensing team has done fantastic, but I think um, they're also, you know, it's worth recognising they're also part of a wider structure now. Um, uh, through through Derek Ben and pull, who's pulled together various parts of enforcement in the council, so that. It feels like they work as a real team now across across discipline, and uh, you know that's been a long time in the works. But I think we've really been feeling the effects in the last six months um, from a really effective, coordinated response. Um, one of the things that um, Derek and I discussed, and I think it'd be an excellent piece of work for for us to look at, is around the future of town centres and 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 the role that licensing can play. Um, so quite what the scope of that might be. Um, is, is for us, but I suggest, Steve, we, we might consider some sort of a task and finish group or to uh, see if we can have a way that uh, the views of the licensing committee can um, either pull together other people in a discussion or contribute to a discussion. Um, we're potentially going to see a lot of change over the next six months um, and how we support good, thriving town centres that are uh, safe and, and fun and attractive places to be. Um, is going to be an important challenge. Do people have a general view that they're happy with that? To be honest, since it was so, so since it was such so vague in scope, I was going to leave it to Derek to 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 just sort of have an indication that we'd be interested in uh, doing a bit of focused work on the on the on the licensed trade in town centres. Often, most of our work when it comes to licensed premises is either the granting or reviewing of a license, and we don't often get to. Do as much of the of the looking at it as a as a strategic piece um, around say you know say Halifax Town Centre or somewhere like West Vale, which is a whole different uh, sort of area, but it's really quite fast and growing. Um, and what we can do is help support those areas and support people who go there. And everybody happy with that? And has anybody got any other comments on the on the update? No, no, no. All right, well, that was a quick and effective meeting then. Um, all right, I presume we don't need to move any recommendations on that report. Janet, I'm looking at you to tell me otherwise. Silence is consent. All right, thank you everybody. That's a good time for a meeting as well. Lovely to see you all and uh, uh, have, a good, have a good night.